Uh, hello and welcome to the Boston Common virtual open house number three. My name is Nathan Frazee and I'm the project manager from the Boston Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, before we jump into the discussion, we want to note that this meeting is available in seven different languages tonight. To select your preferred language, click on the interpret icon that's at the bottom of the screen and select the channel that corresponds to the preferred language as listed on the slide. Zoom has a pre-filled list of languages and we're unable to edit that. We've reached out to them uh, to ask for more language options, but in the meantime, this is our workaround. I'll introduce each of the interpreters who will then introduce themselves and provide the language uh, you need for the proper uh, translation. Unfortunately, Zoom does not provide interpretation on phone call-ins, so if you need this service, you will, actually, you will need to do so through a computer or the app. For Haitian Creole, Samuel will be our interpreter and will be listed under French. Samuel and audience members who need interpretation for Creole, please select French interpretation tab now. And Samuel, if you can introduce yourself, that would be great. Okay, uh, for Spanish, Terrence will be our interpreter and will be listed under Spanish. Uh, Terrence and audience members who need interpretation for Spanish, please select Spanish interpretation now. Terrence, please introduce yourself. For Vietnamese, Lynn will be our interpreter and will be listed under Russian. Lynn and audience members needing Vietnamese, Interpretation, please select Russian now. Uh, Lynn, if you can introduce yourself. For Cape Verdean Creole, Eva will be our interpreter and will be listed under Portuguese. Eva and audience members needing Cape Verdean Creole interpretation, please select Portuguese now in the interpretation tab. For Cantonese, Chase will be our interpreter and will be listed under German. Chase and audience members needing an interpretation for Cantonese, please select German now in the interpretation chat. Chase, please introduce yourself. For Mandarin, uh, we will be our interpreter and is listed under Chinese. We and audience members needing interpretation for Mandarin, please select Chinese in the interpretation tab. We, if you can introduce yourself. For ASL, ASL, we have two interpreters, Cindy and Gabe. They uh, will be listed under Japanese. So if uh, members can need interpretation for ASL, please select Japanese now. Cindy and Gabe, if you can introduce yourselves. And for audience members, if you noticed the pause, that's because on the interpretation tab that they are able to speak on that. <laughs> uh, I wanna make sure everyone knows this meeting will be recorded and will be available on the project website within a week. Uh, please share with any of your friends or neighbors who are unable to join us this evening. We do anticipate that Mayor Walsh will be joining us this evening as well. So when he joins, we'll take a few minutes to hear from him. This open house is obviously a bit different than our previous open houses. We will be, it will be an online presentation and this discussion put on by the Parks Department, Park Design Team from Weston and Sampson, and the Friends of the Public Garden. I appreciate you trying this new format of community engagement with us. We certainly miss seeing everyone's face in in-person interactions. So again, uh, on the top of the screen, there is a view option tab. Feel free to click on this and go to the zoom ratio to adjust so you're able to view the screen uh, and the entire presentation. That may be different on, on individuals' computers. So just do so in a way that uh, allows you to see the full screen and is comfortable for you. The Zoom webinar style has two methods for your engagement. Community members that are viewing on a computer or the app can see the displayed diagram. If you click on the raise hand icon, it will alert one of the design team members and individuals will be called upon in order that hands were raised. You can also enter your questions by clicking on the Q&A at, at the bottom. For anyone joining by phone, you'll have to dial star nine and that will alert us that your hand has been raised. 
uh, you will be called on in the order hands were raised and we the Q, the question and answer session will be held at the end of the presentation we'll be holding the majority of the questions until then we will also be doing a few poll questions this evening you will see those pop up in the window and can either answer directly on the computer or text in your answers the phone number to text into is 617-504-4327 You'll have 30 seconds to enter your answer. So we're actually gonna give that a, a run right now and start with one. So the poll question, the, our first poll question tonight is what neighborhood do you live in? Zoom, unfortunately, only allows us to enter, give 10 answer options. So we had to group a few neighborhoods together, but we're just looking to get a sense of where our audience members are from uh, this evening. So if you do not see your neighborhood shown, uh, or are from out of state or out of the city of Boston, please feel free to enter it in the Q&A tab. So we're going to start right now with, with that. And again, we're, we're giving uh, about 30 seconds to, to get those in. All right, and we're going to close that. And now looking for the results. Um, we have about 5% from Austin Brighton, 31% from Beacon Hill, 9% from the Back Bay and South Bend, 47% from Chinatown Downtown, 2% from Roxbury and Dorchester, 5% from East Boston. Great. It sounds like, uh, it looks like we have a broad range of communities represented, so that's great. Uh, again, we welcome you for coming, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Landscape Architect, Liza Meyer, and she will cover our agenda this evening. Thanks, Nate. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening to learn more about the work that's been going on for the last several months with the Boston Common Master Plan. Uh, in terms of, uh, communicating with the group of us here tonight, as Nate said, um, you, he explained how you can raise your hand. If you have questions during the presentation, you also can use the chat function and um, we'll see those questions. If you want to raise your hand, that's best done at the end of the discussion and then we can call on you then. Um, as Nate said, I'm Liza Meyer. I'm the Chief Landscape Architect with Boston Parks and Recreation. Uh, we have about an hour and a half together tonight, which will include a presentation by our design team, as well as some time for Q&A. The team has a lot of content to cover tonight, and we know that there will be a lot to talk about. Because of that, we've scheduled four follow-up open discussion forums over the next two weeks to give people an opportunity to tune back in to a Zoom meeting the kind where you can all see each other's faces and, and talk more directly, um, and to dive more deeply into the important topics we'll be introducing tonight. So you can see here um, those four discussion forum dates and times. Um, this information is pro posted on the project website, bostoncommonmasterplan.com, um, where you'll also find the recording from tonight, um, as well as the slides that we're sharing tonight will be posted there as well. Um, please visit the website in the coming days for information about how to access the discussion forums. We'll have the access information for the first forum posted within that time frame, and then other access um, updates to follow. And we will also be posting a feedback form on the website that you can use to share your input um, in place of attending one of the forums or in addition to. I'm gonna spend just another minute talking about these first three agenda items, and then we'll hand it over to Weston and Sampson, who will take us through um, the master plan findings and recommendations. If we can go to the next slide. The Boston Common is a hallmark park that with many ties to the identity and history of our city. We wanna respect the common for what it is and address the ways in which it can be made better through this master plan effort. Over the past six months, um, through the COVID crisis, 
the crucial role of parks and open space in our city has been highlighted. Whether for civic engagement and protest, socially distanced gatherings or solo walks, our parks have been essential for our health and well-being as individuals and as a community. That said, there are also ways in which they have suffered from a change in patterns of use this spring and summer, as some of our favorite events and activities have not been possible this year. Some parks have never been busier and others feel a little bit lonelier without a daily influx of downtown workers and visitors. We've learned a lot over these last several months and will continue to do so as we emerge from the pandemic. These guiding principles that are up here provide a framework for the planning work, acknowledging the park's existing identity and character while also directing how we move forward in managing this special place. We've reviewed these guiding principles in previous open houses, so we won't spend much time on them tonight but know that these principles underpin all of the work and recommendations you'll be seeing. This information, as well as the master plan goals and objectives can be found on the project website for those who wanna dig into those a little bit more deeply. Uh, next slide, please. This slide shows our project team. Uh, Boston Parks and Recreation is working in collaboration with the Friends of the Public Garden and are supported by a team of design consultants led by Weston Sampson. Tonight, you'll be hearing from um, many people, both during the presentation um, with others available at the Q&A at the end. So lots of different voices um, from, from these three different groups. Next slide. Uh, the master plan project began in earnest last summer and we plan to complete it by this coming spring. For the next several weeks, our attention will be on the discussion forums and on gathering feedback. After that, we will advance the plan to its final form, which will include phasing recommendations for project implementation. The point of this planning effort is to guide over $20 million of investment in the Boston Common, so our sites are really set on identifying projects we can move forward with in the first phase of implementation. Next slide. For those who might be tuning into this process for the first time right now, I'll give a quick recap of the outreach we've done already. Uh, last summer and fall, we visited events and locales throughout the city, not just around the park, but also in Roxbury, East Boston, Rosendale, China, Chinatown, and elsewhere, um, to meet people and talk with them about the Boston Common. Some of the things we heard regularly were that we should provide more restrooms, um, address the need for a permanent off-leash dog area, protect the trees and green spaces that help us all feel a connection to nature in the middle of the city. We also heard uh, from people how much they love to attend events and programs on the common. And we also heard about an interest in expanded food offerings. I mean, there were dozens and dozens of comments that we heard. Um, we are responding to those, those comments and that feedback in what you see tonight. But if you want to dig into that information, again, it's available on the website and you can find the results of the surveys and other um, outreach opportunities we've had along the way. We held two public open houses to date. Um, this is our third tonight. The first was in October, uh, the second was in January. In addition to those in-person events, um, back when in-person was possible, We've had an online survey as well as regular updates uh, through our project website and social media. And participation in these engagement efforts really relies on people spreading the word to their networks. So if we appreciate all that many of you have done to help with that. Uh, the Friends of the Public Garden has been a tremendous partner with this aspect of the work as well. So again, Thank you for joining us tonight. We look forward to sharing this work with you and to connecting with you over the coming weeks about these ideas as we advance them further. And I am now going to turn it over to Jean Bollinger from Weston and Sampson, who will share um, the findings and recommendations with you for park-wide strategies. Okay, great, Liza. Thank you very much. It, it's really fun to be here tonight in the sense that it's the first time that we're really starting to talk about strategies and recommendations for improving the fabric of, of Boston Common. So as you were noted, noting earlier, we've been in the listening mode for a long time, and then we've spent this interim period during the pandemic really strategizing about how to make use of everything we've heard and translating that into 
actual physical improvements to the form of, of Boston Common. So all of that input to date has really been essential in helping us to uh, focus on the nature of improvements. Tonight, we're introducing some basic concepts for improvements on the common. And um, we're addressing it sort of in two ways. One way is by discussing some park-wide strategies that relate to the 50-acre fabric of, of Boston Common. And then I'm going to hand the baton over to Sherry, and she's going to talk about some more specific improvements in um, geographically more finite sections of the common. So next slide, please, Louise. Um, when you think in terms of park-wide strategies, I know we've talked about this at some of the earlier events. Um, the Boston uh, Common is essentially this 50-acre canvas. And think in terms of a number of, number of layers um, that sort of make up this 50-acre canvas. And um, the layers are many, quite frankly. And this evening, we're really just going to focus on four of those. But there are other layers or, or other systems um, uh, that prevail out in the common that will also be getting attention and that we would also seek to improve. And some of those include below ground utilities, pathway surfaces, pathway edges, lawns, um, above ground lighting and the like. Um, and they encompass the full 50 acres of the property as well. But we're focusing tonight on four uh, topics that we think are of particular interest, uh, that we find compelling, that we think we'll be interested to to the folks that are following along uh, with this interaction this evening. And the first one relates to tree canopy, and then the next three benches and seating, circulation and access and events and program. So when we think in terms of tree canopy, if we go to the next slide, um, perhaps this is one of the most notable uh, and loved uh, qualities of the common. And that is in fact the tree canopy that prevails under current conditions. And there's been an ebb and flow to the tree canopy on Boston Common over the decades and in fact over the centuries. And the uh, essence of recommendations for managing the tree canopy on a going forward basis is to be in a position to plant for future generations in the same way that our forebears did. So we need to be thinking in terms of 30 years out, 50 years out, 100 years out even, in our strategic approach to planting the common. Historically, there's been an emphasis on lining major corridors on the common. There's been an emphasis on defining other spaces. We all know, um, and if you've witnessed it during this incredibly hot summer that's uh, winding down right now, people gravitate to shade. So we wanna do future planting in a way that understands how the tree canopy is valued uh, and in a way that responds to both formal and informal use of, of the common. Next slide, please. Benches and seating. This topic really goes hand in hand with tree canopy in a, essence, in a sense. And on those same hot days, um, when people were seeking um, an opportunity to sit, they were gravitating towards those areas that were in, shade, in the shaded canopies of. Um, the trees that, that form uh, this fabric and this layer of, of Boston Common. So clearly, when we think in terms of bench installations, we think um, sometimes on a single side of a linear pathway. Sometimes we think in terms of both sides of the pathway. And we also think in terms of supporting those special spaces that are out on the common, the spaces like Brewer Fountain and some of the potentially new spaces that Sherry will introduce that we hope to activate from a programming um, perspective and where we hope to create additional seating opportunities. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you for that, Jean. Uh, I just uh, wanna interject, the mayor is able to join us now. So Perfect. it's my pleasure to introduce a great supporter of the parks in our city who has directed historic levels of funding to Boston parks and pushed for Boston to be the first city on the East Coast where all residents live within a 10 minute walk to a public park. He's prioritized equity and safety with permanent separated bike lanes circling Boston Common and the public garden. And now to talk hey, with- Sorry, yes. he's not here yet. Okay, well, um, let's see. Uh, well, that is the mayor's introduction. Uh, 
I will probably end up repeating that in a second, but Gene, I'll turn it back over to you to just finish the slide. Okay, Nate, that's fine. Um, and just please interject, interject when, when the mayor arrives on the scene. Uh, it'll be great to hear his voice. Um, so I think um, I had kind of concluded the discussion about the strategies uh, and recommendations behind benches and seating. And just a reminder, um, we're introducing this tonight. We're not going into a lot of detail and we're going to be boring down into additional detail at our next interaction on September 22nd. So if we go to the next slide, please. Circulation and access strategy. Again, um, really a key part of how the common functions um, and supports both formal and informal use. And it's all about how people arrive at the common from the five streets that form its perimeters. It's how they move through the common. Um, it's how they connect between some of the noteworthy spaces and places and features that are scattered around uh, the Boston Common today over those 50 acres. So some basic goals are to focus our attention on restoring and enhancing those important circulation corridors that exist today, to understand that they're used uh, for a myriad of purposes, including primarily pedestrians, but also service vehicles and emergency vehicles um, and deliveries to the common and, and so on and so forth. So we wanna to continue to be aware of that and restore them with that in mind, that there's a hierarchy of, of users. We've also introduced this concept of creating an internal loop path, which would make use of existing pathways. So we know there's a sensitivity of turning green space over to hard space. So the proposal is not to do that, but it's to create an opportunity for an internal loop, loop that connects you to some of the most interesting features um, scattered about the common, including um, the soon to come uh, King Boston Memorial. And that would be done in subtle ways through pavement treatments and through um, wayfinding, through possibly a phone app. Um, and again, not through the installation of additional pathways. So these are some of the things that we're clearly focused on. There were a lot of people that talked about bicycle circulation. And I think that uh, we've all come to an understanding that the priority on Boston Common really needs to be granted to pedestrians. And there are many times of peak use where these pathways are absolutely overflowing with people moving from one part of the common to another, moving from one part of the city to another. So it's really great um, and not coincidental that the city is pursuing the development of bicycle uh, connections around the perimeter of the Boston Common that would facilitate movement between Back Bay and downtown, Beacon Hill and Chinatown, and so on and so forth, without the need to trans tra uh, traverse in a way that can be cumbersome and inconvenient to pedestrians, um, the inner sanctums of, of the Boston Common. Next slide, please. Events and programs. Um, we all know that the Boston Common is asked to do many things in the forms of, uh, in the form of uh, supporting special events and programs that occur throughout the year, and yet primarily um, in the warm weather months. And we all have an understanding that those special events take a toll on the physical structure of Boston Common. So the project team has been looking at ways to to um, transfer. Um, the possibility of hosting some of these events and programs to different geographic locations on the common. This slide is identifying primarily the key footprints on the common that now support special events. So it's the parade ground, it's an area to the, to the northwest of the Parkman Bandstand, it's the Frog Pond vicinity, um, and it's an area that's over to the, to the north and west of uh, the Visitors Information Center. So um, all of these events clustered within a relatively finite geographic area create, create stress on the landscape. And in fact, many of these geographic locations simply don't have the infrastructure in place to support those special events. Next slide, please. 
So in the form of some of the recommendations, we're looking to expand the geographic footprint of um, venues that could potentially host uh, events from large to medium to small. So we're looking to allocate space by event size and better distribute them throughout the commons. So we're identifying some footprints that we think uh, would support um, additional programming and events. And we wanna make better uses of hard surfaces that are out in the common. So there's multiple acres of hard surface on the common. We perhaps don't maximize their use for staging, uh, for access and for supporting some of the special events and programming that occurs in the common. So we would look to do that. The next slide, please. And finally, um, we wanna improve the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, so the surface. Um, the staging areas, the access routes to these additional footprints so that they can host um, smaller events and special programs at a lower cost to the physical form and condition of the Boston Common. So we've identified um, the desire to have better infrastructure to improve visitor conveniences, which might include greater food options, more restroom options in these areas where we're expecting expanding um, footprint for special events and for programs. So with that, um, I hope this gives people a, at least an initial introduction to some of these system-wide um, assets on the common and the direction of some of the recommendations that we would be putting forward. The next slide I think leads into Sherry's presentation. And I'm going to actually interject, Perfect. hopefully for the correct time this now. Uh, so Perfect. thank you for that, Gene. It's my pleasure to introduce our mayor not only once, but a second time. Uh, we are glad to be joined by a great champion of our parks, uh, the mayor of Boston, Martin J. Walsh. Nate, thank you very much. I heard, I heard the, <coughs> the first introduction was so much more like deep and, and thoughtful. I really <laughs> want to thank you for that. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to take much time out of your uh, schedule, but um, I just want to, uh, first of all, thank everyone uh, for the work you're doing uh, on this in the planning of this of Boston Common. Um, I have to tell you this, honestly, I've been there for six years. Uh, I am not focused on legacy. I'm not focused on that type of stuff. Um, but one of the most exciting things I think that uh, we're doing right now in the city of Boston is the work that's happening on the Common uh, and Franklin Park. Uh, it's transformative. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's our central park, if you will. Um, th there's so much, I'm so excited about it. And I want to thank each and every one of you for what you're doing there. Um, when we sold, went to Square Garage, there was no question in my mind. I, before that, I was thinking about how do we redo Boston Common? Um, and, and I wish we, I wish I owned the garage. I don't know if this is public. This is off the record. I wish we owned the garage underneath uh, because I would take the money from that garage and invest it in the park. Uh, and, and I would really, you know, have full maintenance crews and, and safety and everything on that park is because it should be a jewel in, in the heart of the city. And it will be when we're done. And so thank you for that. Uh, thank you, for Ryan and the Parks Department team. Uh, when I became mayor, um, my love for parks is, is because one reason is because when, when I was younger, I coached, I coached and ran the Little League in Savin Hill. And, and our kids were playing on McConnell Park. And it was, it was nice, but there was glumpy grass in the outfields and, and the infield was hard. And, and then when, when the summer came, we, we did the travel teams. And, and I would go to Burlington and I would go to Milton and I would go to these other parks and I'd see the grass green and manicured. I'd see the lines drawn. I'd see all the beautiful place concessions. And, and I thought to myself that our kids in Boston deserve top-notch baseball fields and, and top-notch soccer and football fields. And, and as I get older, you know, um, when I was a state representative, um, I, I filed an amendment in 97, and not, not to bore you, but I apologize, but in 97, I filed an amendment, which was money for $21 million to build Pope John Paul Park. And I filed an amendment for $7.5 million to do the extension on Hallett Street. And it was part of a bigger than a Ponce Greenway walkway. And I saw how a, a dump, uh, movie theater dump now a park is transformative to a community 
Uh, I was able to get money, I, although I didn't, I didn't finalize it, Danny Hunt did my predecessor, but the Schaefer paper site down Port Norfolk, which was a contaminated paper site in Army Base years ago, and now it's a beautiful passive park. Um, and, and I think that in, 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 the, in, the urban, in the urban community, in the urban core, it's so important for us, not just to have green space, but to have really good active green space and green space that people can be proud of. And what, you're, what you, all of you are doing with, with this plan design is just amazing. And I wanna thank you all for it. I wanna thank you for your support. I wanna thank Ryan and the Parks Department. I wanna thank all the folks here. Um, when this is done, uh, I'm, we're gonna look back on this and, and really see, uh, not just talk about public gardens, but talk about Boston Common. So that's really all I have. Liz, no offense, I'm not taking anything away from public gardens, but I, I just wanna make sure, and, and the friends of the public gardens, there's a lot of you, sorry. I don't wanna take away from any of you. I, I love the public gardens, but I want Boston Common, the other side to be, to be as equally as beautiful. Uh, and I just wanna say thank you for taking the time um, to, uh, to do this work. Uh, Nate, thank you for your introduction. I appreciate that. Um, and, and that's, I'm not going to take any more time because I know you're on a limited, not limited time, but you want to get through the designs and I want the design. So I want to get the shovels in the ground. And I, I told Ryan the other day, I want this part. I want to get shovels in the ground. So thank you very much, uh, for that. And I don't know if any questions, if you want to ask me any questions, you feel free, but I, I don't think that's the intent of the call. Yeah. Uh, thank you again, Mayor Walsh, for joining us. I think we're going to be opening the questions at the end. Uh, so we don't have that feature uh, okay. set at this moment. So. But thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate it and, and uh, appreciate the support you give to the project. I appreciate it. Now I'm going outside to celebrate uh, a Latinx celebration and lighting the building up. <laughs> ah, enjoy. We're building a park out here. We're building another park out in front of City Hall that's gonna be beautiful as well. So it's gonna be a compliment. It's gonna be kind of a, a sister park, I guess you will, to the common or maybe a brother, brother park, whatever it is. Uh, so we're gonna do some beautiful stuff here. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. So now I'll be turning it back over to Sherry and the design team to go over some of the proposed improvement areas. Thanks, Nate. Um, so we're going to run through, as Nate said, some of the proposed improvement areas. Um, we'll do that relatively um, in short order. And then if you folks have questions, um, actually, can you go to the next slide, Louise? We're actually holding um, office hours, if you will, or uh, open forums for conversations around specific areas. So we really encourage you to join us. So if you're interested in park-wide strategies for improvements, that's happening on the 22nd of September from noon to 1 p.m. Uh, it's bring your own lunch. And number two is visitor activities and play. That's on September 24th from six to seven. Performances and active recreation on the 29th from noon to one. And then finally, gateways and edges um, on October 1st from six to seven. And you can see those areas in the common um, that are color coordinated. So as we go through this, obviously we will have time for Q&A today, but deeper dives into each of these areas will be taken in these open discussion forums, which will also be held online. Next. So we're gonna take a look at uh, the areas that we just showed you. Jane already covered the park-wide strategies, but now we're gonna take a little bit of a, um, a tour through some of the more well-known activity areas on the common and areas that we saw really ripe with opportunity for improvement. Um, whether that improvement was more multi-generational use, ease of maintenance, more sustainable design practices, more inclusive design. Um, we'll go through those right now. So the frog pond obviously really feels like the heart of the common to many people. Um, water play, ice skating, the playground, these are incredibly valued and often pretty crowded. Um, we heard a lot in our pop-up in Chinatown about um, how the playground is absolutely critical to them as a neighborhood and it's often incredibly densely packed. So more shady seating is needed, more different opportunities for play for big and little kids in the playground and the frog pond. And then the pavilion of the frog pond, which is the building that's adjacent to the frog pond, um, it really doesn't adequately support staff and visitor needs. There aren't enough restrooms, 
Um, there's always been a demand for more services out of that building. And so that's something that we took a look at. Next. So in this proposed scenario, we're looking at expanding that building, which is known as the Frog Pond Pavilion, and adding amenities. Um, that might include food service, that might include uh, more bathrooms, certainly a better facility to support um, the chilling function for the um, ice skating rink. As many people know in the winter, the big trailers show up behind the Frog Pond building to help support the chilling of the ice. Um, planting trees to increase shade, expanding the children's playground. So um, the previous slide showed the playground footprint. This slide, it's expanding it to take up a lot more of that lawn panel and really to leverage the amazing components of that landscape in that area. There's a slope, there's really cool trees, and to make it a much more vibrant um, multi-age playground area. Expanding seating options is important across the common and then providing the infrastructure for multi season events and flexible programmed use. People also noted that there's parts of the frog pond that are underutilized. It's a pretty big footprint. So we took a closer look at how we might be able to um, rethink how a lot of that hardscape is used. Next slide. So in this first image, you see the existing conditions. Uh, this is, while it is a reflecting pool, so wading is not allowed, but this is the end th that the view is taken from where the snow is loaded um, when the Zamboni empties out, and you can see the frog pond building, and then at the far end is really where that spray jet exists. Next slide. This rendering, we started to really reconsider what's possible here. Is it possible to create a flush splash pad slash fountain in this end of the frog pond so that there isn't standing water and it becomes a much more inclusive, accessible water play feature? And then at the, at the end, away from this view, there can be the water depth that everyone knows and appreciates. And the, the ground plane can slope evenly so that people can move seamlessly between um, those two areas. The Frog Pond Pavilion itself could be expanded, and this is based on a study done by the Public Facilities Department a few years ago, looking at how that pavilion building can really start to serve the common in a much more robust way and relate on the backside to some of the pathways um, that you see there. Next slide. And then also possible is to, when, it, when it's more of a reflecting pool, is to allow this area to be more plaza. Could it have tables and chairs and umbrella seating? Could it have uh, vendors? Could it be a functional space for events? These are all things that we're thinking about in really um, leveraging this awesome resource. Next. So then as we look at the Visitor Information Center, one of the things we really heard besides the need for more restrooms, which you'll all note is a theme throughout what we've heard, is that the building itself is actually incredibly small. The inside, you, a lot of folks have gone in to use the bathroom and it is tight and it really is not serving um, the intent for tourism um, and really as a, as a welcome center for folks visiting. It's also disconnected from Park Street Station. So when people come up from the T, they're sort of looking for where the Visitor Information Center is and it's not obvious. So it, it ends up feeling disconnected from the rest of the park and almost more like it's connected to Tremont Street. And we wanted to take a look at how to reconnect that with the Frog Pond, the bandstand, and a future connection to the King Memorial will also be needed. Next slide. So here you can see we've, we're considering expanding the Visitor Information Center so that there is more space for more bathrooms and then it also actually has a face to it that fronts the park itself. So we're taking a look at visitor resources and amenities, establishing a pedestrian connection between the center and the Mayor's Walk as you can see at the center, um, providing pathway connections that will really connect folks to all of the amazing amenities that are around the Visitor Information Center and increase seating options and park wayfinding. And the next image, you will see um, an existing photo 
of the back of the visitor information center now. I think it's most beloved for off to the left. Sometimes the ranger horses hang out there. Um, but this is a really underutilized parcel of land and a huge potential for connecting to the common and providing a whole new opportunity for gathering space and seating um, and programming. And in the next image, you'll see some of the thinking about what that could look like. So we're talking about um, a accessible pathway that might have seating on either side, um, a really beautiful tree canopy planting, and a doorway that allows you to enter the visitor information center, pot potentially grab a snack, use the bathroom, get a map, um, or scan a QR code on your phone and get um, a specific tour that can be self-led. You can see on the right side of the photo, um, two things. One is the King Boston Memorial is um, in the background and that's generally the location that's currently being proposed. And then in front of that, you can see um, the tour guide leading folks through the common. And this is a really important node where a lot of those tour groups meet. And so providing an opportunity for folks to gather is really critical as we look towards improvements. Next. So this next area is what we're calling the athletics area. And to follow up on Mayor Walsh's comments about really having outstanding facilities for the city of Boston, um, you know, one of the things that this pandemic has offered is an opportunity for a lot of these athletic fields to um, rest and to not be used as intensely. So um, we took a look at really the use patterns that are happening out there now, um, the ball field configurations, and there's actually a slope that exists between the ball fields and the Earl of Sandwich. And that area is an opportunity um, for reuse. Those ball fields all have outfield fences, and so that really limits the playability of that larger um, open space. It's pretty far from restrooms, and um, the tennis courts actually, um, we've all sort of wondered um, who put them there. They look like they sort of fell out of the sky, but they, um, I think it was just intended to be directly north-south, but they're not um, congruous with the surrounding pathways, and so we're looking to make everything just fit a little better. And in the next slide, you'll see some of our early thinking about what that might look like. So here we've actually combined the ball fields into one multi-use facility that would have a movable pitcher's mound and movable bases so that age groups and, and play levels could all be addressed in one facility. And that means there'd only be one backstop, which is the large vertical chain link fence that you see out there now. Um, in the top left corner, we're looking at a fully accessible restroom facility and increasing the flexibility of the actual athletic field means that a rectangular field could be in, as you can see, ghosted in, um, in the outfield area and run that whole distance. This allows there to be a wide variety of sports and events. People can play um, sideways on the field for younger kids. It really just increases flexibility and allows it to serve a much broader range of um, residents and visitors. So um, we're also looking to improve visibility and access. And you can see that the um, tennis courts have been rearranged. They're now end to end and they run along the pathway. And that area to the left or to the west of those tennis courts is actually a proposed off-leash dog area that would be fenced and would allow folks to um, let their dogs off leash in a way that's contained um, and secure. Next. So here's an image um, of the existing conditions, and you can see the wear patterns in the lawn uh, from intense use. You can see the tennis courts, and you can see the umbrellas at the Earl of Sandwich area. And in the next slide, you will see proposed conditions, which really expand that athletic lawn area, um, combine the uh, ball fields into one. You can see the off-leash recreation area in the bottom right-hand corner and then the tennis courts. And we're looking to create a real hub of activity at the Earl of Sandwich Plaza so there'd be more flexible seating and there'd be this really important adjacency to park and bandstand. And so these would start to play off each other and facilitate a much broader use with increased shaded seating. 
Next. So we're at Park Street Station here. And one of the things about Park Street that's a little deceiving is that um, it might seem like it's pretty flat because it's all paved, but the slope from Park Street down to the T station is actually pretty steep. So for anyone in a wheelchair or in a walker or um, with any sort of mobility impairment, it actually is a real challenge to navigate through. And not only is, the, is it a challenge from the slope perspective, but also because there's not clarity about where pedestrians should be moving. There's vendor carts, sometimes there's um, protests happening. So clarity around how that space is organized is really needing, needed. Um, so if you look at the next slide, we started to consider what might be possible to create a fully accessible route through the plaza to the MBA headhouses. And I'm sure many of us are familiar with the improvements, the award-winning improvements that were just made to Government Center, where there are sloped walkways with terrace seating and stairs. And you can see an image there of what that looks like. And we've talked to a bunch of folks who know both spaces and they really have appreciated how easy it is to navigate the improvements at Government Center. So we're just taking a look at what might be possible here at Park Street that would allow us to provide better support infrastructure for vending and programmed use, improve the wayfinding, um, really protect that iconic view shed up to the State House through Liberty Mall, but also allow there to be a meaningful pedestrian arrival and wayfinding through Brewer Plaza over to the new Visitor Information Center Plaza. Next. So um, one of the things, of course, that's also incredibly important about the common and I, you know, it's funny how the mayor noted the public garden and that's what everyone thinks of. Um, and that's partly because it is so ornamental and lush there. But another thing that makes the public garden feel so special is that the entrances and the thresholds are very ornamental and very ceremonial. And I feel like in some cases um, in the common, that's not necessarily the case. So we're looking in this particular case at Charles Street, right mid block, and you can see in those images if you're standing in the middle of the road, don't stand there too long, but if you do in one direction, you're looking at the public garden and then you turn 180 degrees and you're looking into the common. And aside from the difference in vegetation, which is really intentional and important difference between the common and the public garden, there's really a lack of gateway here um, as you move across Charles Street. So in the section on the bottom, we're looking at really um, historically influenced um, typology of pillars and piers and fencing that will create this really meaningful threshold that as you cross in, you know you're going into somewhere special. Um, the common is America's oldest public park and worthy of more celebratory gateways and entrances. Next. So those are the areas that we've taken a look at. And as I mentioned, the intention is for us to take a deeper dive into each of these. Um, on the 22nd from noon to one is the park-wide strategies that Jean talked about. And then we're gonna take a deeper dive into visitor activities and play. So that'll be the Frog Pond play and Tadpole Playground. Performances and active recreation is on the 29th from 12 to one and Gateways and Edges is on October 1st from 6 to 7. Once we get all this feedback from all the various sessions and we've, there's gonna be um, polls available, you'll be able to submit comments, not only from what you've seen and heard today, but throughout the next few weeks so that we can really collect a lot of robust feedback. We're gonna consider all of that and then we're gonna come back to everyone um, at a date that's to be determined with a revised plan that's really getting close to a preferred master plan for Boston Common that's addressing all the things that we've heard and really realizing the goals and objective and design principles that we have laid out through this process. Next. So Nate, do you wanna take back over for the poll? Um, sure. Well, so we're gonna do our second poll of the evening. So you should be seeing a, a poll that popped up and it's 
The poll question is, which of the open discussion forums do you hope to join? You'll see four options. And I'm going to start the timer. We'll have 30 seconds to give a response. All right, that is 30 seconds, which was just long enough for my toddler to sneak by. I, uh, Christine, there they are, perfect. So we have 67% are going to attend the park-wide strategies for improvements, 44% uh, visitors and activities in play, 51% for performances and active recreation, and 54% for gateways and edges. I also have a few that came in uh, through text that are for the park-wide strategy. So that looks like we'll have great attendance at all of these, and we look forward to that, uh, engaging you all in those discussions as well. So I think at this point, we're going to uh, start the question and answer portion of the evening. and. Uh, I have to open it up, so bear with me. There we go. Um, so we have uh, just we just want to reiterate again the the methods of engagement for that. Uh, if you uh, click the raise hand, that will indicate on our uh, to one of the design team members that you are wanting to ask a question. We will then unmute you, uh, and you'll be able to ask that question. You also can click on the Q and A portion. Uh, icon and type your question in that way, and they'll be taken uh, on a first come basis. If you're on the phone tonight, you'll be dialing star nine, and that will raise your hand, and you'll have to dial star six to unmute yourself uh, and so that you can ask that question. All right, what is our first question for the evening? Neat. Uh, this is Cassie. I'm a senior landscape architect with Weston and Sampson. I'll help facilitate the questions that came in through the presentation itself. Um, and we'll start off with a question from, for Sherry on uh, can playgrounds, can the playground be expanded to accommodate age appropriate areas? That's a great question and it's something that we heard a lot in the outreach and in the pop-up comments from neighbors and folks that use that playground and that is exactly one of the main reasons that we want to expand the footprint is to give more breathing room for younger kids for older kids for different kinds of play right now the structure that's in there is very beloved and it's really a pretty big structure with limited capacity for different age groups. And so we will be taking a look at how to maximize that footprint and think about gross motor skills and fine motor skills and age appropriate play. Um, and also some quieter spaces off to the side so that people can um, take a break and have a snack because right now it is uh, on really beautiful days, completely overrun. So uh, great question and the answer is definitely yes. Thanks Sherry. Um, I have another question for you. Uh, curious if there will be a basketball court in the new proposed plan. Um, they allow for more people to use the same amount of space since tennis is a very limiting sport in terms of usage per square foot. Another great question. Um, it's definitely something that we've taken a look at and we've considered and we've heard from a lot of folks that those two tennis courts and, and witnessed <laughs> that those two tennis courts are very well used. Um, and do see a lot of different folks um, occupying them from time to time. Um, it's something we also take into consideration what's close to the commons. So where's the closest basketball court and can the need be met there? But it's absolutely something that we can um, just take another look at. Thank you. We have a few questions coming in. Uh, either Sherry or Jean, maybe Sherry, since you're on a roll here. Um, well, 
about the corner of Tremont and Boylston Street and what we're doing to address that corner? Um, another awesome question. It is a really, really great opportunity to improve so much of the common and a really important gateway. Um, so there's a lot at play in that corner. There's a lot of really um, active neighbors with the colleges and universities. Uh, it's very close to downtown crossing. It is right near Deer Park, which is currently the maintenance yard. And of course, let's not forget the MBTA stop. And so we do know that the T is working very hard at a Green Line transformation plan. And both Park Street and Boylston Street T stops are under consideration for improvements to accessibility and safety. And those ultimately, those decisions will obviously have an impact on the surface of the common. So we are coordinating closely with the T to make sure we understand um, what their needs are and work to come up with a great solution that honors the park with the um, appropriate response, but also provides the T with things that they need. And so that area um, is just delayed a bit behind the others because of those other considerations that are happening. Great, thank you. Uh, a question for Jean. Um, why the why is the Park Street Park Square corner not identified as a gateway? So this is the um, corner of Boylston Street and Charles Street. I assume uh, is that question. So it it is a good question, um, and it could be a minor oversight. We have talked about uh, one's arrival from. Um, the public garden across Charles Street and from the Park Square area and from where the transportation building is located. It is an, a, it is an important arrival point. Um, it ally, aligns with Columbus Avenue, which heads all the way out into the south end. And I think that we're looking to bring uh, certain aspects of what Sherry was laying out for this primary entrance at the midpoint on Charles Street connecting to the public garden to each one of the entrances. So uh, we're looking to upgrade and create sort of a sim similar uh, design vocabulary sense of arrival at multiple locations, including the corner of Charles and Beacon, uh, where there already is a gateway that has some historic uh, lineage associated with it, uh, to the center block on Charles Street. I think to that um, edge and entrance at Boylston and Charles Street, and also to what Sherry was just talking about at the Boylston Street Station and earlier at the Park Street Station. Um, and in fact, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, that motif to the arrival of the Visitors Information Center, which are, aligns, of course, with a, a street coming off of Washington Street across the way. Great, thank you, Jean. Uh, and while you're on, another question for you about park-wide strategies. Um, in the master plan, will bikes be allowed to cut through or would they likely be expressly prohibited like in the public garden? So we talked a little bit about this um, and you know I'm actually somebody that uh, negotiates this area via bicycle and I've come appreciate to come to appreciate the most efficient and most safe ways to get around. I mentioned that there will be articulated bicycle accommodations installed along Tremont Street, Boylston Street, Charles Street. And we think that this will be very helpful in facilitating the movement of bicycles around the perimeter of the common. You know, the scale of the pathways of the common makes this really tricky. And I, and I mentioned in my comments that we're really trying to give priority and precedent to the pedestrian. And at peak periods in time, which we're not experiencing right now, but we can't forget, um, Mayor's Walk, um, Railroad Mall, and certain other corridors out on the common are absolutely jammed with pedestrians. So to try to commingle bicycle traffic, um, particularly during peak periods of time, is difficult and it's complicated. And we're not gravitating in that direction at this point in time. So I have noticed with less um, activity on the common in recent times, 
that people are strolling through the common on a bicycle, whether it be a blue bike or their own personal bicycle. Um, and they tended to go through at a very slow rate of speed, and that's with much reduced levels of, and much reduced volumes of traffic. But I think when the comet gets back to operating, acting, functioning, um, the way it has historically, with tremendous amount of commuter use, that introducing bicycle to these corridors really creates complications that we're trying to avoid. We're also not trying to expand the width of these corridors dramatically to accommodate an additional use. So I hope that um, helps at least in, in part respond to that, to that question. Thank you, Jean. Uh, and now a question for Liza. Uh, we have received several questions and comments about the combinations of drug, alcohol, and aggressive panhandling on the common. Um, so I'm hoping that you can address those concerns. Just unmute. Um, yeah, those are those are real concerns. And I mentioned um, at the very beginning of the presentation tonight that you know we've seen changing patterns of use out on the common and in many, many parks. Uh, it's not a, a, something that's only happening on the common. Um, during the COVID pandemic for the last six months, it's really changed how people use public space in, in myriad ways, both you know, increasing use. Um, by some decreasing use, you know, adding use in ways that make some people uncomfortable, and then a lot of us using parks uh, more frequently than we ever have. So it's, um, we're seeing sort of the best and some of the most challenging aspects of, of park use. Um, but we know that there is a large public population of people um, who congregate on the common, who are struggling, and who need um, support. And um, this is an issue, and the Parks Department has been working cross-departmentally to try to address um, these issues and provide support. So we're working with the Boston Public Health Commission and um, Boston Police to offer aid and shelter to these individuals and to break up negative activity and behavior um, when we can. And uh, people who go to the common regularly may see that um, several police are now stationed out in various spaces on the common um, so that they can be um, more quickly responding to, to incidents, problematic incidents. And as we move forward, we'll, we'll continue to work um, with these departments and others who can help us engage in improving this, these conditions and supporting um, the needs of people who are congregating on the common with a hope that over time um, that patterns of use, you know, go back to a place where if some people are feeling uncomfortable on the common now that they will feel um, comfortable again and we'll start to see um, maybe a better balance of activity in the future. But this is a long term um, issue. It's not something that will be able, you know, it didn't just spring up overnight and it's not going to be resolved overnight, but it will take um, regular time and commitment um, going forward. I see we also have one hand raised. Christine, are you able to unmute um, Sarah so she may ask her question? Did that disappear? Sarah, you can speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, this is a very exciting uh, project. Glad to see it happening. I just had a quick question um, about the park ranger uh, mounted unit, which when they're there, they're a beloved iconic safety presence, tourist attraction. Um, they come with a trailer usually and a place when they're off duty. And I know the friends have been big supporters over the years. Um, when it was mentioned that that area could be um, improved or transformed, just wondering, uh, hoping that there, you're accounting for some space for them somewhere.
Sarah, thank you. Um, we are, absolutely. They're an important part of the common um, and the culture there. And I think that there are a couple of opportunities to think about the Rangers' presence and how they can be most effective. And we absolutely have heard um, that the horses and the mounted unit are an awesome part of the common. And it's something that will absolutely be integrated in the master plan. So thank you, it's a great question. Thank you. I'll chime in again with uh, some questions that we've received in the interim. Uh, Sherry, for you, uh, will there be an effort to purchase more appropriately sized park maintenance vehicles in the near future? The trucks are off at Block Rail, the Railroad Mall and some other paths during more morning commutes. So I'll start, but Liza, if you want to jump in, let me know. Um, so I know we have worked very closely with the superintendent of maintenance. He has been involved in this, and I know that there are absolutely um, aspirational goals of getting more sustainably powered trucks and potentially smaller scaled vehicles so that they don't take up as much room and they don't have as big an impact on the common. Um, and that's all part of how we look at the pathways as well. Uh, making sure pathways are the right width and turning radiuses actually are super important. So you'll see really sharp corners might be um, especially worn and that's because maintenance truck, the maintenance trucks are having a hard time navigating. So it's twofold. One is making sure that the um, common is designed in a way that can receive the highest and best maintenance and then um, also sort of making sure that the maintenance strategy and the materials available to them are right sized. Yeah, I don't think there's much to add except to say that there's a whole layer of master planning that is spatially oriented that is sort of what we're talking about tonight. And then there's a layer that's more management oriented that we're touching on tonight through the Q&A, uh, mostly less so in the presentation. But that does not mean that those management questions aren't part of the thinking in the master plan. Um, and that involves maintenance, yes, and rangers, and safety, and events, and um, when is when is a, a lawn panel allowed to rest for after it's just had 5,000 people on it? Um, these kinds of things that all go into making the park a success, overall funding, you know, all of that. Um, so it's they're great questions and absolutely questions that people should be asking and that um, are part of the thinking as we go forward and we should be able to be more explicit about um, our goals in all of these areas as we as we move towards the, the further into the master plan process closer to having a final plan. Thank you, Liza and Sherry. Um, I'm going to switch over to Liz Visa from the Friends. We uh, have a question about how do you anticipate the King Memorial will impact the plans for the common? Well, thank you for asking that question. As we all know, we will be having a King Memorial on the common. It's been uh, at work, uh, the Mass Design Group and King Boston have been hard at work on um, moving that process forward, that design forward. And the Friends and Weston and Sampson and the Parks Department have been working very closely with them. We've had a number of design um, meetings and uh, rolling up our sleeves with them to make sure that whatever uh, the final form of the design is, not just the memorial, but the larger precinct that the uh, um, plaza around it and the, and the larger landscape has a really nice, good inter integration to the larger common and it is mowable, maintainable. Um, so it's been a really good working process with them. I think it's gonna take some time to get it to the point where it is ready to be, to be built. Um, it will certainly be well used. People are coming to the visitor center already and asking where the King Memorial is. So we anticipate there will be a tremendous amount of use of it and a lot of interest and, and uh, people flocking to see it and experience it. I think this is going to mean that there will be an important, um, one important aspect of it is to make sure it's well maintained. To, to have a sustainable plan for long-term maintenance is going to be a really important part of making this um, a success for the city and something we'll all be proud of for the long term. Great, thank you, Liz. Um, I'm going to switch over to Jean. 
to address uh, the dog park, uh, we received a question about um, the pros and cons of the, the dog park versus the rotating uh, panels that are out there currently. Sure. Uh, it's a good question. It's, a, it's something that has come up at earlier interactions. It's something we've talked about a lot. It's something that we've been trying to observe, you know, the continued operation of the rotating um, dog park footprints that are out on the common today. And for folks that make use of it regularly, the one that's over closer to Beacon Street um, is the one that seems to be in the highest demand. Uh, very frequently, you know, there's eight or 10 or 12 um, dogs in there and their owners congregating in that area. A lot of folks like to sit and hang out in that area because the views of, of Back Bay are really quite beautiful over there. Um, but it's been something that is um, very difficult to maintain and uh, long-term very, very hard to sustain. And at any given time, you will notice um, Pet and their owners actually outside of that footprint. But anyway, um, what we tried to do was understand what was the square footage that was dedicated to that. And then there's a slight buffer zone surrounding that, the adjacent pathways that define it. And then we looked at the size of the one that's over closer to Tremont Street as well. And the footprint that we're showing over um, adjacent to the tennis courts, um, we think is a strong location. Um, because it's in between the ball fields, the tennis courts, it's near um, a potential restroom accommodations. And um, it's a little bit out of the fray, if you will. And it's about 14,000 square feet, which is not much different than the square footage that's been dedicated over on the Beacon Street side of the common under the rotating program. So we can talk about this a little bit more at the next interaction and perhaps we can make a chart available that identifies the square footages that are at play here um, in regard to the two rotating footprints that are out there now. What we're showing is this proposed footprint and maybe related to some other um, dog park amenities that the city has implemented um, in neighborhoods uh, surrounding the downtown area. So, uh, look for some more information to be shared on that, but, but thank you for the comment. Uh, we continue to be trying to find uh, a strong resolution to, to this item. Thank you, Jean. Uh, I'm going to pass uh, over to Sherry for a question uh, more on the physical improvements. Uh, on ball fields, are we planning to illuminate those and what hours would they be illuminated? And then to to a supplementary question about basketball courts, um, just clarifying what our intentions are there. So the ball fields right now, there are two and um, they do serve different levels of play. The intention is to combine those into a more multifunctional field that has a movable pitcher's mound and potentially adjustable bases so that different levels of play can use the same footprint. We're also taking a look at a movable outfield fence so that during um, baseball and softball seasons, there can potentially be an outfield fence for that playability. And then when that season is over, it potentially could be removed to allow much more flexibility. And the intention here, as far as when is it going to be open, when is it going to be closed, it's all going to be a part of the permitting and the demand. And that's something that the Parks Department will evaluate um, as those requests come in. To respond to the question about basketball, as I mentioned earlier, someone else asked about that as well. And there's a lot of possibility here. One is a multi-use court that allows this paved area to function in different ways. We're also, we've taken a close look at where the other basketball amenities are in the neighborhoods. How far away are they and do they serve um, the area of the common? Um, and we've also taken note that those tennis courts are well used and are sought out by um, a lot of folks and are often busy and you often have to wait. So um, we are really carefully considering how to make best and highest use of those paved areas. Great, um, and I'll continue with you on a question about the master plan and our main priorities. Um, so, you know, with unlimited time and money, the whole thing is a priority, there's no question. And I think 
that there's two parts to this. One is the park-wide infrastructure, pathways, trees, things that Jean talked about at the beginning. There's absolutely a priority to make the park more accessible, more inclusive, and easier to maintain. And then on the second hand, there's also really specific capital improvements that I think of more as um, transformative projects. So the Frog Pond is an example. It's a hub of activity. It certainly has served the park well, but the use is really outgrown the capacity and the playground. The use has outgrown the capacity. And so that's an area I think that would really go a long way with an investment of renovation and transformation that would serve a larger pos uh, population in a much more inclusive way. So um, I think the same can be said about Park and Bandstand and other places, um, but we really wanna be strategic about where we start so that as we move forward, um, other pieces fit and fall into place. Great, um, thank you so much, Sherry. Uh, a question for Jean. Um, what is the use of adding canopy trees on Tremont Street um, and maybe just it's uh, a lengthier um, response here and I can read it. The benches that were recently added across from residential buildings are mostly used, utilized by drug dealers or pot smokers. Uh, and since most people, families and visitors who visit the common go inside the park and don't hang around the benches, um, please just consider that uh, that uh, area and the additional tree co coverage there. Yeah, see, can you repeat the first part of it relative to the trees along Tremont Street? The actual question this is, what is the use of adding canopy trees on Tremont Street? Okay. Um, you know, there's some complications to planting along Tremont Street to begin with. So uh, we'd have to go back to that plan, which I'm not suggesting we do. And the plan is really quite conceptual anyway. We're trying to indicate that there's an opportunity to consider additional planting where it makes sense. And I think that gets vetted uh, in a forum much like this in regard to where it gets, where uh, additional tree plantings get implemented. And it probably gets, they probably get implemented on a couple of different mechanisms, there may be an opportunity, opportunity to do some common wide planting. Um, and that's one way. A second way is through the individual improvement programs that Sherry's been talking about. You know, the opportunity to do tree planting in conjunction with that. I don't think that we're suggesting uh, a great deal of additional tree planting along Tremont Street. The canopy is fairly robust in places. Um, could there be some canopy management done along that edge? I think so. But we've also got um, the roof of a subway system to deal with. So we're actually quite limited in the amount of canopy tree planting that we can do along the Tremont Street edge. So um, I don't think we're proposing a lot as far as new along that edge. And I think that's a good comment and we appreciate that um, comment. The bench installations, um, you know, there's been a, a gradual reduction in the number of benches out in the common over a period of many decades. Um, some of them have just not been replaced. Uh, they've worn out, they've been damaged and haven't been replaced. Sometimes a bench has been removed because it's proven to be problematic um, relative to the use that occurs in, around, on top of that bench. So I think we do want to continue to be aware of that um, and the activities that occur in different parts of the common. I think what we're really trying to do is increase capacity for seating because very frequently there's not enough seating out there. But we want to do it in places that make sense and we want it to accommodate the right and great and proper uses that, that it's intended to support. So I'd also just note, as we've been talking about, there may have been problems historically even before COVID. But certainly, um, some of what we're seeing out on the common at this moment in time is even more uh, acute. Um, so it'd be great to see things settle back down again. It would be great to see the throngs return to the common. And when high numbers of people return to the common using, using it in the way that's appropriate and desired and intended, 
it tends to discourage some of the other activities um, that may have been taking the place of a more open uh, canvas of, of land, if, if you will. Thank you, Jean. Uh, while you're on, uh, there was a question about uh, the cemetery. Is there a plan to restore, beautify, and provide access to the historical cemetery? Is that sticking with me, I, I trust? Uh, since everybody else is conveniently muted. Yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've identified this as a great and amazing resource, uh, an incredible historical asset out on the common. We'd like to improve accessibility to it. Um, I'm not sure how much detail the master plan will get into in that regard, but it's definitely a goal to improve um, the availability of that um, burial ground footprint, people's ability to get to it, uh, to circumvent it, to understand uh, what's great and unique and amazing uh, within the confines of that burial ground. Um, at the same time, it's a really delicate space. So I think we have to be cognizant of that and provide improved access in a way that sort of makes sense and doesn't uh, create too much pressure on a resource that's, that's relatively delicate. And Liz, I don't know if, if you have some thoughts on this or, you, or Eliza even that you want to chime in on this beyond what I've said. Yeah, I would just say it is an amazing space. It's a beautiful space, uh, mature trees. We heard in the last um, public meeting, I was in the breakout that talked about this, this corner of the park and there was interest in, in uh, being able to get in there with greater ease. I mean, there's some limitations in some of the access points like along Railroad Mall. It's not easy to get in there. We have uh, um, crypts and you can't get through that, but whatever in whatever ways we can increase um, accessibility, as you said, Jean, we want to try and do it because it is really a wonderful part of the common. And I actually love that picture that we show when we started doing park-wide strategies. It shows the cemetery. Many people don't even know there's a cemetery, don't acknowledge there's a cemetery. So in whatever way we can make it a more accessible and comfortable place to go, we would like to do that. Uh, Liz, there's a question for you. Um, can, uh, can you speak to how the new restrooms would be maintained? Just thinking about your experience with the restrooms on the common right. and address both from a security and a hygienic cleanliness perspective. It's absolutely a great question. And we all very much miss the pilot bathrooms that we don't have out there this year. Um, 800 people a day are not able to use them as did last year. So it's a real loss. And as you who asked it probably know, we have security, we have uh, a cleaning regimen, and those are absolutely important things. I think a couple of things we need to explore when we talk about the, the restrooms by the, the um, playing fields is a design question. There are some, bathrooms that are designed to minimize safety issues and, and use issues. And we also have to talk about whether we combine that with some staffing. Is there somebody there that has another role in the park and is getting into the question of maintenance and management, which we have not addressed tonight, but we are thinking about and talking about is how can we um, improve and strengthen the maintenance and management of this park and what does it mean for staffing as well as just the operations that happen out there. So we will be looking at and in the final plan we'll be talking about how that bathroom can be clean, um, safe, and a good place for people to use. It's, it's a great question. Thank you Liz. Um, I'll pass it over to Liza for a question about um, enforcement of uh, bicycles. So the question is, how do the planners anticipate enforcement of the proposed restriction on bicycles crossing the common? And note that there's now no smoking on the common, which is never enforced. Bicycles are very resistant to having, um, having a restriction. Right. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I don't expect that um, people's activities are going to, you know, they're not going to change their ways overnight, but I, we have not had the kind of bicycle infrastructure around the common that's proposed to be made permanent, um, like the recent announcement uh, for dedicated bike lanes around this park. And um, those dedicated bike lanes are 
going to be installed in a way um, so that they're sending people on the desirable routes, the more level routes around the common that are, um, you know, we're not asking people to go up over Beacon Street in order to get from point A to point B. Um, they can take the, the flatter route around um, to Boylston to get downtown. Um, so I think once there's a safer way that's not, who would want to bike down Charles Street? That's terrifying. And I think that if we can create the infrastructure that, that makes um, bicycling in the city work better, then we have a way to say your bike, you know, you can't be biking in this park. But right now there aren't safe places or until recently there weren't safe ways for people to bike um, around the common. And so by providing that, um, it gives it gives people a way way to, to move around. So enforcement, um, enforcement happens in a few different ways. Park rangers can help with enforcement, park staff can help with enforcement, um, park users uh, can help with enforcement by by demonstrating the right behavior, by being someone who walks their bike through the common instead of being on their bike. Um, it's similar to, you know, dog use and, you know, proper use, proper behavior with dogs in parks and improper behavior with dogs in parks. Um, you know, there's, it's impossible to go out and, and, you know, catch every last person who's not managing their dog properly. But um, dog owners can model good dog behavior, bike riders and bike users can model good bike behavior. And I hope that we'll get to a place where we don't see as many bikes on the common as we do now. Um, I don't expect that we're gonna immediately see no bikes on the common, but I would hope that we will get, get closer to that um, over time. And I'll echo that as uh, one that tries to commute through downtown, mostly on bicycle. Uh, the infrastructure around the common uh, from a uh, commuter standpoint, will make it much easier to use. And what I would imagine is the typical users that you would see cutting through the common would be going at a much slower, more casual pace than the, the faster uh, commuting cyclists that propose a little bit more of a dangerous scenario. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you would never see me uh, ride my bike through the common. <laughs> Just want that on the record there. Uh Thank you. And so we have one last question. Um, we'll certainly continue it, uh, hearing questions if, if anybody has, has more to chime in on. Um, but maybe for you two, um, Parks and perhaps Liz too, if she'd like to chime in on this one. Um, how do these ideas for changes or improvements to the common track against funds available for these purposes? Are these calibrated against the budget for this project? Yeah, I mean, we have um, money, as, as the mayor said, we have money from Winthrop Square, which is great, but that's going to be a drop in the bucket. When we actually do this plan, when the final recommendations get put on paper and we, we cost them out, it will be many more millions of dollars than $23 million. Um, there are some opportunities, for instance, the, the Frog Pond, I think there will be opportunities for the city to find corporate support, uh, foundation support. I think we need, well, we certainly do need to take that basic pot of money and multiply it many times. So getting back to Sherry's comment about how to be strategic in identifying the most important first phase things, and we'll be listening to you and wanting to hear from you and going back to the comments that we heard from all of you over the course of the year about what is so critically important in this park. Um, but, but our goal is for excellence. Our goal is for this park to be at the highest quality, despite the fact that 7 million people a year go through it and we have hundreds of events um, and it gets loved to death. I think that's why we need to commit ourselves to this. That is to, the beginning is the plan and is the commitment to a certain number. And then we have to find resources beyond that money that we wonderfully got from Winthrop Square to, uh, to make this happen in, in, in many different places, leveraging a lot of different sources to make it happen. One thing I would note is that we've been working with other agencies uh, as well. Uh, so we're going to try and partnership, uh, partner with them when they're doing some renovations. So the MBTA has some anticipated construction projects in the future that impact the common. So we'll be looking to uh, see how those projects can mesh the best uh, for, for leveraging that money and, and having it go as 
far as possible. The so, other thing I'd add to that is that, um, you know, a master plan guides and informs work that will extend over many, many years. This is um, a plan that could very well um, guide the common for 20, 25 years. And it's fantastic that we have funding already at the level that we do to um, make a, you know, a, some serious steps in implementation, not, you, you know, not just a, a, a tiny first project, but we can make some substantive improvements with the funding that we have and can leverage with these funds. But we also know that implementing the entire plan will take time. And we um, anticipate this to be a plan that, that we live with and um, implement incrementally as funds are available. So um, we'll be looking at how that can make sense um, in, in the coming phases, as others have noted. Great, thank you. So we've reached our time for tonight. Uh, there is the contact uh, contact information on this page has the project page that you can, if you visit that page and click on that, uh, there's a way to do additional uh, feedback from tonight. If you click on the, the master page, then uh, click on virtual open house, scroll down to that page and there's an open house number three feedback. So you can feel free to go there if you did not uh, uh, feel compelled to do so during the meeting. Uh, my contact information is also on this page. You certainly can feel free to email me or call. Uh, and any of your, the input you get through that will also be recorded in the messages or uh, in the meeting minutes. Um, with that being said, I would also suggest going to the project website to uh, follow the additional meetings that will be taking place over the next uh, week or so. And, we look forward to hearing from you on that. And we thank you. Uh, we thank the uh, interpreters tonight and we appreciate everybody coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Have a good thank evening. Thank you. Great.